and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Drexel University Picture Gallery. Today our guest is David Denby, a longtime film reviewer for The New Yorker. David Denby is also the author of several books, including the widely acclaimed Great Books, My Adventures with Homer, Rousseau, Wolfe, and other indestructible writers of the Western world. This is the first of a two-part interview. In this first part, we'll talk about films and film reviewing. In the second part, we'll talk about David Denby's other writing and his views on literature and culture. David Denby, welcome to the Drexel it's Interview. It's great to be here. Well, I know that your first reviewing job, or at least your first major job, was with New York Magazine. And after that, after, uh, I guess, spending several years there in the 20. 1980s. 20. 20, yeah. Okay. It's a you, long haul. It's a long time. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> uh, you went to the New Yorker. Right. And despite the fact that they both have New York in their names, these are different sorts of publications. And I wonder if you had to adjust yourself, change your style in any way, moving from New York um, Magazine to the New Yorker. A little bit, but uh, the, the New Yorker is harder to write for. Uh, it has a magazine with a glorious history. Not that there's anything wrong with New York Magazine. I had a wonderful time there, but the New Yorker has its always you know, distinguished literary past, and the editing is very stringent, and it's a national magazine, and New York Magazine was strictly local. Um, although, at the New Yorker, because of enlightened editorial policy, we do write about things, small films, like a new mo movie from Romania, that many of our viewers are, are going to have trouble seeing at that moment. Uh -huh. uh, but we'll, we're trying to, you know, say, down the road, this is something you want to rent or something you want to buy, you know, that you want to look Even at. Even though it would so, just then be available only to New Yorkers. At that, yeah, point, at that point, it might be yeah. only available, and it'll be, you might come to Philadelphia, it might come to Chicago, Boston, right. Los Angeles, San Francisco, but um, it's a national magazine, um, and it has certain style requirements, uh, you know, and that are... Rigid? Strenuous, not rigid. <laughs> okay, strenuous. I they like would that. never change yeah. a comma without asking you. Really? Nothing is imposed on you. Uh -huh. But if you do a longer piece, not the formal reviews, but say an essay, mm. and if they don't think it works, they will ask you to do it again and again and again, if really? necessary, three times over. Huh? So did you feel going to New York, to the New Yorker from New York that you were taking on? A sort of it was a weighty responsibility. Well, I, I sort of drifted over because some of this book, great books that you mentioned, mm -hmm. was published in the New Yorker when Tina Brown was editor. While I was still at New York Magazine, I okay. was very, very lucky that I was allowed to. Write okay, for so you two. were writing a little bit then when you. It's were like starting. being at a doctor at two hospitals, you know, in the same town. <laughs> so I sort of <laughs> got used to this uh -huh. uh, editorial standards and the, that kind of extra effort. Okay. You are the film reviewer with Anthony Lane right. at The New Yorker, and I guess the two of you divide the films between you. And I know people are curious about how that works, Do you, uh, how you divvy them out. There's no m mystery. The answer is almost shockingly banal. It really, most of the time, depends on what movie is opening and whose week it is, and also what Anthony can get to see, mm -hmm. because he lives not in New York but in Cambridge, England. I didn't know that. He's, yeah, he's very English. His father was an admiral and his grandfather was a general, and he teaches at Cambridge part-time. So, and he goes into London and sees things. Um, so it's, it's sort of like, oh, it's you know, February 10th issue, you do this. Uh, I mean, there's a guy who keeps us on track, keeps us out of each other's way. Um, but the, the two voices are very different. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure you noticed. <laughs> How would you characterize Well, no one words? ever talks this way around the magazine because it's just not done. But I, he's a suave, erudite <laughs> Englishman who comes mm. from this family, you know, that's central to Eng English power, even though he's a kind of throw out from, he's not in, you know, the armed services. And I tend to sort of be morally earnest, Upper West Side Jew who thinks that, you know, civilization is going to fall into the Hudson were it not for Columbia University. So that, you know, <laughs> he can be serious and I can be funny, but there's a difference. He tends to be uh, funnier on the surface most weeks. I tend to be more serious. And I think the audience for the magazine likes the, the get alternating back and That's so voice. interesting. So you feel that the un you're underlyingly more earnest and Victorian, in a sense, than the Englishman. I think that, yeah, that the movies are so. part of our national mm. culture and that, that, you know, that it's 
it does affect um, the way we look at ourselves and who we are, and, and it matters to me what becomes a hit and what doesn't, that, all those kind of things. And I inherited that from Pauline Kael, who was the great movie critic at The New Yorker in the 70s and 80s, um, who, who took on every film as if the whole you know, film culture were at stake, which was maybe a little melodramatic. I don't think that's true. Films meant something but to Pauline it Kael. Meant, yeah. It meant enormous amounts. There. And it's important to me that Avatar is good. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, that, it's, that it's a big screen experience because it's, everyone's looking at things on smaller screens. And, and you mean it's, it's good for movies? It's good for you, movies. Yeah. Um, and there's a few interesting debate going on about what it means, a political debate right. uh, as well. Uh, but I think, you know, principally it's a fabulously gorgeous, sensuous adventure story. And it's a big, big screen experience. Um, so it's drawing people back into theaters. I get alarmed when people talk about you know, looking at movies on an iPod or at a tiny screen. Because what was enthralling around you know, 1914 or 15 when D.W. Griffith was making Birth of a Nation and Intolerance and so on was the sense that you went into this darkened space like church almost. Strangers communed in darkness, right? And there was this overpowering revelation. So it was almost a religious experience. Now, you know, that sounds a little grand, you know, if you're talking about a Kate Hudson comedy at the mall or the latest thriller. But Avatar is restoring that kind of wonder mm -hmm. to well, movie going. When, and that, that yeah, matters to me. When, when you speak like this about movies, I assume that movies then were very important to you growing up, that they were formative. I, I mean, if you were, um, were a kid in the 50s, what you looked at on television, apart from the variety shows and maybe the news, if you were a more serious kid, was essentially old Hollywood movies. Million dollar movie. Million dollar movie. Yeah. And that's when I saw the, you know, 30s gangster movies and musicals and comedies. And I think that's when I fell in love, when I was like 12, 13, 14. Okay, um, well, talking about old movies, can you tell us a few, I mean, you've mentioned in passing, I guess, some movies, but some of your well, absolute favorites. Well, the thing that they got right so often was romantic comedy. Yeah. And the, the, the getting sort of equals together, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, you know, they knew how to bring, and there were many lesser couples, they knew how to yeah. bring people together who were, would, you know, vibrate together on screen. Screwball comedy. Screwball yeah. comedy and post-screwball comedy. Mm -hmm. That has gotten harder and harder to get right. Um, there are some very good scenes in Up in the Air, the new George Clooney movie with George and Vera Farmiga, who's a wonderful actress, just beginning to be well known. And it has that kind of old balance. There's even some sort of slightly dirty talk in a hotel bar that will remind you of, of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in mm. The Big Sleep. There's a famous scene in The Big Sleep. This is 1946. Anyway, it has that, and it made me realize how rare it was and how wonderful it was. And yet, romantic and how much comedy I missed it. is so popular now. I mean, it's they seem to there. be churned out constantly, yeah. and you feel, for the most part, they're second or third rate. Well, there was an odd period, and, uh, and knocked up was the culmination, maybe, of where you had women who were together, who, you know, wanted to get on with life. They want, some of them were corporate. Even Drew Barrymore played mm -hmm. this role a couple of times. Kate Hudson, even. And, and the men, you know, were, like, improving their record yeah. collection. <laughs> That, well, yeah, yeah. high fidelity type. That was wonderful. Yeah. All of, there were four <laughs> movies based on Nick Hornby novels, a right. good writer, but it was the same pattern each time. The guy was, you know, cultivated, but sort of lazy, loutish, and sometimes they were really loutish. And, and so there was Seth Rogen and Knocked Up, you know. Was, Did you like those films? Do you think that they were I was films? shocked by Knocked Up the first time I saw it, because here was this sort of, you know, out of shape, a uh, guy, ordinary looking guy, laying his hands on Katherine Heigl, and I was <laughs> outraged. Um, and, uh, and you were outraged because you thought it was just too incongruous? Because, you know, I, yeah. I just, yeah. you know, like there was a notion of equality that was both physical and sort of spiritual, say, in the older movies. Uh -huh. And I could, and all I saw was this bear, you know, <laughs> uh, laying his hands on, the, on this fawn. And, you know, so I came <laughs> home, and, and, and my wife said, What's wrong with you? So she took me back to see the movie again, and then I saw that it really did have mm. a kind of balance. I mean, because Seth Rogen is very funny, and he grows a lot during the movie. I that's, seem to recall that you point. wrote a really interesting I wrote a long piece on, yeah. Yeah, on romantic comedy, what it used to be mm. and what it was right. becoming. Now, we had a reversal last summer, um, 500 Days of Summer, 
very charming movie with, in which Zoe Deschanel was the wandering, not sure what she was going to do with herself person. And the guy, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, was, was, the, wa was uh, together upright, and yeah. wanted to become an architect. Huh. So maybe the poles are reversing. Interesting. Um, I haven't seen that film, but no, now, it's now nice. I'll rent it. You can rent it. It's yeah. nice. It's so you nice. feel romantic comedy, that was something that was done really well in the 30s and 40s, and that perhaps we do less well. What about specific films, perhaps outside that genre, that you well, like others, to watch Well, uh, other things again? that seem to have uh, um, fallen off a little bit in movie making, but are moved into television, like the Western. Mm -hmm. I mean, after Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, it seemed like there was very little left to say. But then you had Deadwood a few years ago, you know, so where they opened up the language of the West and made the whole thing much darker and more profane and, you know, every, everyone had sort of cynical motives or almost everyone. Hmm. Um, or crime films, uh, which, which still are there in movies, but now you, there's a lot more of it on television. So TV is sort of adding the code, is doing the coda that's sort of finishing off the genre. And these things will be reborn. Right. They again. will never die. I met a young filmmaker last night. Mm. Uh, an independent filmmaker who was ma making a Western said in 1849, he said, because nobody ever does that period before the Civil War. It's almost always 1870, 1880, the Indian Wars, you know, the fallout from the Civil War. Um, so they'll always be finding there'll always a fresh be someone angle. who will find a fresh period mm -hmm. or an angle. Well, I wonder about getting back to your film reviewing. You, you review so much and you've watched so many films. I wonder about uh, burnout or a a dulling sense that, that must come over you at times. What, do you feel ever that you lose a certain perspective or a certain freshness? Well, uh, Anthony and I are lucky in that we don't have to see everything. I mean, I do, I do catch up to a lot of things that I don't review, just to know what's going on, just look at the actors and see if there are, you know, directing talents and so on. And there is exactly what you're saying. Like, I don't like to go to film festivals particularly because you can see four movies in a day and you begin to feel like a sponge that's been squeezed too <laughs> often. And, I, and the images flow into one another and you lose the sense of the unity of a single film. Yeah. Now I have colleagues who go to them all the time and I've been to them. But I don't, and I, I'm snobby about this maybe or lucky to, enough to think that anything good is going to come to New York eventually mm -hmm. in one form or another that I can wait. Now in terms of the of films that you do review, do you, um, are they, do you choose them and, and those are the ones you know you're going to review or are they assigned to you or do you watch a few and then choose from that group? The last. Okay. No, nothing's assigned. Mm. But, you know, I've been doing this since, you know, 1910 in one place or another. So, I mean, you have to develop a sense of what's important and what isn't. I and, mean, and who are you looking for? I mean, which directors that come out that you know you're going well, to you watch? Well, you know, if it's James Cameron, obviously you're interested in what he's been doing all these years, you know, um, or anything by Spielberg or Scorsese, you know, or young directors like Paul Thomas Anderson who made There Will Be Blood. Mm. Um, you know, there are people, you, or Steven Soderbergh, who takes all sorts of chances and does odd things. Whom and, you seem to like a great deal. And I also deplore some of his <laughs> movies. I mean, I yeah. think some of them just are duds. And some of them are alive and funny and interesting. And, and Soderbergh has interesting ideas about how movies should be financed. Too. He's trying to think through the whole picture, um, so we get out of this rut of super spectacles. You know, so he's 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 an interesting character. But you have to be prepared for something to drop in on a left field that you've never heard of. Um, and how do you get yourself to see that sort of thing? Well, the left invitations field? come in, and then you make a selection. Um, and then th there's a guy in the office who who is keeps his ear, you know. Um, like an Indian scout to the ground, which is to say to the internet, and listens to what is being said, because a lot of these things are shown at festivals somewhere. So there's a buzz that There comes is out. buzz. Yeah. Uh, most of the buzz is about big spectacles, um, but not all of it. So if something's at Sundance, you know, and certainly people are going to talk about it. Mm. Um, and there's a, there's, there are various kinds of underground filmmaking now. There are micro-budget films. There's a, a genre that's called mumblecore. And these are movies made literally